Now, lower down in the same page, Korotev acknowledges the existence of at least the small Apollo samples that are rich in quartz. There are some rare and small lunar samples with 50 to 70 percent silicon dioxide because they contain tridimite, quartz or silica glass. These include felsites, or granites, and related silica-rich rocks like quartz monzodiorite. Korotev then puts the typical silicon dioxide range for moon rocks between 43% and 47%. Okay, no argument there. But then he has this to say about calcium oxide, and how the contents of the two types of oxides compare with their terrestrial cousins. Similarly, among nearly all common lunar rocks calcium concentrations vary by a factor of 2, from 10% to 20% as calcium oxide. This is much less than the range in terrestrial rocks. A rock with silica or calcium oxide concentrations substantially outside these ranges is almost certainly not a lunar rock. For a while, I wasn't sure where Korotev got the idea that moon rocks generally have less calcium than terrestrial rocks. Because if we look back to our comparison of Big Muley and the JSC-1 simulants, we find that although Big Muley is somewhat richer than lunar regolith simulants, both are within the 10 to 20% range for calcium oxide. The exception being JSC-1A, 9.9 CaO, which is still close enough. Likewise, the Apollo 11 samples and deep sea basalts that Mason and Melson analyzed both have calcium oxide contents within the 10 to 20% range, even without subtracting 18% of the moon rock's ilmenite. Likewise, they have similar compositions of silica. You can look up the chemical composition for any Apollo sample, such as these from the Handbook of Lunar Soils, and all of them are generally 40-something percent silica and somewhere within 10 to 20% calcium oxide. And yes, these numbers are commensurate to their terrestrial cousins. Korotev states that moon rocks are distinguishable from earth rocks because they have SiO2 and CaO concentrations within certain ranges. And yet, we have undeniable terrestrial rocks with concentrations within the same ranges. It wasn't until I looked up the chemical composition of various terrestrial sedimentary rocks, such as these for terrestrial sandstone rock samples, that it became clear that Korotev was again only comparing the Apollo samples to terrestrial sedimentary rocks, but, for reasons unknown, failed to clarify and state the exception. It is these sedimentary rocks, such as limestone and sandstone, which have silica and calcium oxide contents outside the ranges for Apollo samples, not the terrestrial igneous rocks. Here are some various other problems with this web page. Even though studies that long predate this web page specifically state that the lunar samples contain water contents within the ranges of 1000 parts per million to 1500 parts per million, and that terrestrial contamination is thought to be low, and that various Apollo rocks do contain hydrous minerals as a result of their water contents, Korotev assures us... Hydrated or water-containing minerals have not been found on the moon. Lunar samples show evidence of formation in an extremely dry environment with essentially no free oxygen and little gravity. Now I'll assume that Korotev is one of the guys who dismisses these hydrous minerals and the water in the Apollo samples as contamination and subsequently doesn't mention it when discussing these rocks. But considering that he only compares them to terrestrial sedimentary rocks and chondrites, not terrestrial igneous rocks and eucrites, these no water statements are not very reassuring. Clearly, Korotev's article on distinguishing moon rocks from earth rocks is, at best, not thorough. And if Webb is indeed being sincere in his presentation of this data, the page is also misleading. In fact, reading through Korotev's bio, we come across this rather interesting disclaimer. Dr. Korotev's main interest in meteorites is with that small fraction, about one in a thousand, of meteorites that is from the moon. Dr. Korotev is not a geologist, which means he doesn't know as much as he should about terrestrial rocks. He also is not really a meteoriticist, which means that he also doesn't know about regular meteorites, the other greater than 99.9%, .9 as he might. 
However, he does know some real geologists and meteoriticists, and he does ask them questions when he is stumped, which happens a lot. Dr. Korotev has personally found many meteorites in Antarctica, but he has never found one anywhere else. He has seen lots of meteorites, but he hasn't seen them all. On a cold evening in 1989, when his ants met teammates showed him the two stones of the Mach 88104 and 5 lunar meteorites in the field and asked, What do you think about this one? He not only did not instantly recognize them as moon rocks, he said they weren't meteorites at all. He likes to think he's wiser now. Right now, Webb and his followers are probably saying, Oh, Jarrah is just poisoning the well here. Nothing could be farther than the truth. All I am doing is investigating and evaluating Webb's source of information. As Jay Windley once wrote, If a doctor of mathematics tells you that 1 plus 1 equals 3, his degrees and honours do not make the statement correct. I don't know how Webb operates, but in the past, I have interviewed many, many scientists and astronomers and so forth. And every now and then, I may ask them a question, to which they reply that they are not familiar with the said subject or are not an expert in that area. As such, I make the right decision not to quote them on the said subject unless what they do say along those lines can be substantiated to the ninth degree. If Karatev openly states he is not an expert on terrestrial rocks or non-lunar meteorites, perhaps this is why his comparisons are not thorough. Perhaps this is why he only compares Apollo samples to sedimentary rocks and chondrites, rather than terrestrial rocks and meteorites in general. Furthermore, given that the various minerals that are supposedly absent in the Apollo samples have been found in these samples, what now? Would the scientists just use this as padding to their theory that the Earth and Moon shared the same origin? Or, as was the case with the water in the samples and their subsequent hydrated minerals, would they just dismiss it as terrestrial contamination? I bring this up because the latter is exactly what happened when lunar meteorite Dofar 287A turned up with A. different oxygen isotopes to the Apollo samples and B. calcite. In the document, Oxygen isotope constraints on the origin and differentiation of the moon, we find Dofar 287A possesses the highest oxygen 18, 6.56 per mil, delta oxygen 17 equals 0 0.005 of any lunar sample, in agreement with a previous analysis of this meteorite. However, the anomalously high oxygen 18 value 6.56 per mil, determined for Dofar 287A, is most likely a result of low temperature desert alteration on Earth prior to collection. Terrestrial alteration is suggested by the presence of calcite, gypsum, and celestite veins within this sample. For this reason, we do not plot Dofar 287A in comparison diagrams of lunar mantle derived melts. Korotev also mentions a few unnamed lunar meteorites that also contain calcite. He states, Some lunar meteorites do, in fact, contain calcite. However, the calcite was formed on Earth from exposure of the meteorites to air and water after it landed. Isn't it interesting how meteorites were believed to originate from the Moon after comparison with the Apollo samples, but when one turns up different, the scientists remain far too trusting of NASA and blinded by this misplaced trust, they look for a reason that unwittingly shifts the truth out of the spotlight. No, I do not think that these individuals are liars or stupid. I just think that their trust is misplaced, and that they do not realise that they have been betting on the wrong horse. This is no different to the case of William Bryan. This nuclear engineer discovered many photographic anomalies in the Apollo record and his misplaced trust in NASA caused him to reach wrong conclusions. Despite writing a whole book on his findings, not once did he insinuate that the Apollo landings are fate. The flag is waving? Oh, the moon must have an atmosphere. Astronauts can't jump very high off the ground? Oh, the moon must have gravity stronger than 16G. This is pretty much the same approach that geologists take in regard to the samples. Water in the Apollo samples? Oh, it got there by terrestrial contamination. Hydrated minerals and ferrokine in the Apollo samples? Also terrestrial contamination. 
Lunar meteorites different in isotope to the Apollo samples? Oh, it's terrestrial contamination. Is it just me, or does terrestrial contamination and alterations seem to be going around a lot lately? But that's just changing the goalposts. In other words, if you find calcite, or for that matter, any mineral or isotope that propagandists claim are absent in the Apollo samples, they can just blame it on contamination. Clearly, Webb's hype over the alleged absence of quartz and calcite and other minerals in the Apollo samples is just a red herring. Bottom line is, these minerals are not absent in the Apollo samples. And quite frankly, why should he care if they are absent? As far as he and the lunar geologists are concerned, the Apollo samples are real whether they contain water or not. The Apollo samples are real whether their chemistry and mineralogy are the same as the Earth or not. The Apollo samples are real whether they contain quartz or not. The Apollo samples are real whether their oxygen isotope ratios are the same as the Earth's or not. And the Apollo samples are real whether they contain calcite or not. It's circular reasoning at its worst.